What's poppin' y'all? It's your boy Big Stacks Pazingas. I'm here and I'm controlling the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, first things first, disclaimer for the episode. I don't want to set any expectations of, of what's going to happen, but I just want y'all to know that this first episode is going to be an overview. We're going we gonna to put a plan together and, and set some things up so we can get exactly what we want to get because with this team, it's not a rebuild. Um, it's more so of a retool. Uh, making the playoffs won't be satisfying. Uh, getting out the first round won't be satisfying. This team, this organization, and this city wants a championship. That's the expectation, and I'm trying to deliver that. So first thing first, uh, my staff that I put together as a GM. I did some ballsy things here. Uh, my CFO is a friend of ours, uh, through the wire friend of ours, Mike Mason. He is a University of Illinois alumni and graduate. So I put him at the CFO position because he's very intelligent and smart, and I think he'll be able to handle that. My assistant GM goes by the name of Kenny Beecham. Some of y'all may know him as the king of the fourth quarter. Um, he has some experience in rebuilding and, and retooling and some GM experience, as y'all would know uh, from his 2K videos. And then a head coach, this is the ballsy move. As a GM, I hired myself as a coach. I got a job to deliver, I got a job to do it. I don't trust nobody more than I trust myself. So therefore, I made myself the head coach. We are gonna do things my way. If I'm gonna lose or if I'm gonna fail, it's gonna be because of me, not because of anybody else. So that's why I'm gonna take that position. My assistant coach goes by the name of Mike Hurd, also the co-host um, on Through the Wire. Um, yeah, he's just uh, an assistant coach, you know what I mean? Um, I'm, I'm hoping he can, he can add some things and it's just funny thinking of Mike as an assistant coach. That's why I'm, I'm chuckling to myself. Y'all know Mike. Like, just, just think about Mike and then picture him with a suit on, um, on the bench, instructing a professional basketball player what to do. Um, <laughs> my head scout is my, my father. Um, I, I put my dad at the head scout, scout position instead of anything else. is because that's, that's where my dad specializes. He's, he's a player developmental type of guy. Uh, he sees the game. He's, he can scout it, that's what he prefers to do. So he's gonna be there. He's also gonna kind of be an extension of me because me and him share the same type of thought process when it comes to basketball. Um, and I'm gonna have him be buddies with Ben Simmons. You know what I mean? He's gonna make sure Ben Simmons hits the level that we need Ben Simmons to be at for our team to thrive. I will call my dad more of a point guard whisperer. Um, and we're, we're gonna have him being best buddies with Ben Simmons to make sure Ben Simmons is doing what we need him to do for us to win a championship. And then last but not least, my trainer is Derek Miller. Uh, if any of y'all are keeping up with uh, Through the Wire outside of just our episodes um, and just our personal life or our social media, y'all know Derek is, is having a body transformation this past summer. He's been in the gym and training and, and doing his thing and he's getting himself into excellent shape. And we're all proud of Derek, so I thought it was fitting that we put Derek as a trainer because he's now um, specializing in that field of knowing what it takes um, to get your body right. And we're gonna have him being best buddies with Joel and B because we're gonna need Joel and B to not only be in shape for his health and to be on the floor, but to make sure that while he is on the floor, he's playing at the most dominant level that we know he's capable of. And that starts with him being in shape. So that's me introducing y'all to my staff, top to bottom, um, you know, I know y'all see some of the pictures like Kenny. That's that's just Archie Goodwin, former Kentucky Wildcat, uh, who played was drafted by the Suns. Mike Mason actually looks like Garrett Temple, so I, I made sure I went and got that for some reason. Face templates in 2K has players that are still current, and G Garrett Temple is one of them, as y'all can see. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this face template is Ray McCullum out of Detroit um, University. He was drafted by the Kings. Um, he actually had game. <clears throat> and I'm surprised he's not still in the lead. The last team I seen him with might have been the Spurs. I could be wrong. I don't know. This I think this is just a face 2K just 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 throws out. It's a generated face that Mike has. And then my dad is Francisco Garcia, Louisville legend. And then um, uh, Derek is Jason Maxiel, Maxiel from former Piston. So that's always fun to see the faces that they have. So now as far as the overview of the roster that we have. Um, me taking control of the Sixers, like I said, it's not about making the playoffs. This is different than a rebuild. It's not, they're looking to win the championship. They've, they've done almost everything except, except that they, they haven't made an Eastern Conference final, but they've got, they've made the playoffs for the last few years. They've gotten out the first round, 
both of these guys have been all stars so you know the, the little successes you know they're, they're not they're not throwing parades for those anymore they're trying to get to that next level and the next level is ultimately winning the championship the easy thing to do or the quick thing to do would to, would be to trade one of these guys but obviously the, the direction that the Sixers are going in is to try to do everything they can do to, to, to succeed excuse me with them instead of giving up on his duo um, because they're both just too talented to give up on you know it's kind of like the OKC trio of Harden Russell um, and Durant you know we look at that and say they gave up on it a little too prematurely so we make it sure that we don't do the same things here um, the hard part though is working on getting complimentary pieces when you have Tobias Harris making 34 million dollars over the next four years and when you have Al Horford making 27 million dollars over the next three years um, there are bright spots on his roster that I am going to highlight like for me um, Matisse Thibel um, has potential to be the perfect 3 and D guy that the Philadelphia 76 and need. Perfect. I think Josh Richardson already is like a complimentary guy for them. Um, he can be up and down, but I still think this is the type of wing that they would want playing shooting guard next to Ben Simmons. Um, and this is the same prototypical type wing um, that Matisse Thybul can develop into. I'm also a fan of Shake Milton because he's 6'5 and he can play combo guard. Uh, he can play on the ball without the ball. I think that compliments Ben in the backcourt. Um, as far as <clears throat> the wings, I mean, we have Tobias Harris. You would love to get Tobias Harris at the four, but I just looking at the roster, I don't think there's any way that we we, we would be able to do that um, without messing something up. So realistically, Tobias Harris, as much as I'm not a fan of it, he probably will be our starting small forward. Uh, Furkan Korkmaz will probably bring him back. Um, just the shooting. He just provides an incredible shooting. And then Glenn Robinson, he has a player option that he's probably going to accept. I would be highly surprised if he declined it. If he does, we'd love it. Save a little bit of money. But uh, just a, a wing who's athletic potentially can knock down some shots. They have him listed as an A, which I don't understand why 2K does that because then you go, okay, he's 82. Some guys, they'll have an A3 and it'll be like 73. And it's like, why? And, and you'll see his mid range is high. And it'll be, Mid range and three point shots are two different things. So I, don't, I hate that 2K sometimes clumps them together. But 82, 82 for uh, Glenn Robinson isn't bad. The best three point shooter is my guy from um, Iowa State, Shyock, who looked like a Kevin Durant lookalike in Summer League. If you know, you know he has 87 3. Uh, Furkan Korkmaz is 84. Um, so we got to get some shooting. As far as, <clears throat> as far as just my overall viewpoint about certain things uh, a lot of these guys probably won't like expiring contracts I, i'm not looking to bring too many of these guys back because we have five draft picks and on paper 11 guys are, suppo are supposed to come back so already if we bring back 11 guys draft five that's already 16 players and that's one more than we'd be able to bring because you can only have 15 players on your roster so if we do 16 somebody's getting cut and that's no reason to dra waste a draft pick or anything like that. And then also free agency, the little wiggle room we could have to potentially sign anybody, whether it's a mid-level exception, a veteran, whatever, we wouldn't have any room. If we bring 11 people and draft five, there's just no room to add anything. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, like, Raw Neto won't be back. Uh, Alec Burks, he probably won't be back. Uh, Shyock won't be back. Uh, you know, like I said, if, if Glenn Robinson declines the option, I, I won't sweat it, I'll be happy. Uh, and then I want to try to, Kyle O'Quinn and Novell Pelly, they'll, they'll be gone. Um, and then I got to try to do something with Mike Scott. I got to try to move Mike Scott any type of way that I can. And of course, we're going to explore Horford. The thing about Horford is that, <clears throat> you know, he's not just a guy that, that's just going to be thrown around. He's, he's going to be a tough guy to trade because who wants Al Horford for what he's been bringing to the table? This past season and then at 27 million over the next three years he's already 34 he has some things he can bring to the table but i mean he's just not it's not at, at the contract level it hurts his value he's not really that movable we can't just throw him around but one thing that i, I have been exploring in my mind is a situation where we would move al horford um to the cleveland cavaliers for kevin love now, a lot of people would would say, why would the Cavaliers do that? Well, if you pay attention to things like I do in 2K, 
you'll start to see things that'll let you know what's going to happen before they happen. So right here, it says that he has a player option, right? $28 million. Now, obviously you might want to take that if you're Andre Drummond, but seems like he's not happy in Cleveland. So he's not going to sign it. It's not that he, they don't think he will. He's literally saying, I'm not going to resign. So because I can see that, I know that they're not going to have a center. I know he's going to be a free agent. Same thing with Tristan Thompson and every other center that they have on staff, except Zizek is a restricted free agent. So it doesn't matter how he feels about his situation. If the Cavs want to bring him back, which at 23 years old, they probably will. He's going to be a Cavalier. But Jordan Bell, unrestricted and won't resign. He'll be gone. Tristan Thompson, unrestricted and won't resign. He'll be gone. And then Andre Drummond, unrestricted, won't resign, he'll be gone. So with that being said, they won't have a center on roster besides Zizek, who is at 23.73 overall. It's not much ready. Um, so in my mind, what now? Let's get Kevin Love if we can, because they would have to accept it, obviously. And we'll give them Al Horford. You move him to center. Now he's on a team that can actually use him. He would be their starting center. And not only can we do that, because we're not just going to swap the players, obviously. But the incentive for the Cavaliers is that we have a 21st overall pick in the first round. Which, in this type of draft, can help them. Because they don't, they don't, they have a, they have a nice, nice young core. But they don't have, out of their young core, Colin Sexton. Yeah, right now Colin Sexton is the most standout guy. But even with Colin Sexton, he's just solid. They don't have that standout young player who looks like he's going to be an all-star. They just have a nice group of them with Sexton. They have Garland. They have um, Osmond. They have Kevin Porter Jr. And then they have the fifth overall pick in this draft. And then I give them the 21st. And you'll have a nice core of six young players. You have, um, you have... Al Horford being the starting center because at the fifth overall pick, they're probably not going to draft um, a starting center. And then also the incentive of giving Kevin Love to us and taking Al Horford. Yes, Al Horford is on a shitty contract. They're both on two monstrous contracts. Um, but if you look, the total that you're paying Al Horford is $81 million. And the total that you're paying Kevin Love is $91 million, which means they're gonna save $10 million over the next three years versus paying Kevin Love. So not only do they get Al Horford, who will be their center, they're gonna get a first round pick, but they're also gonna save money and, and, and be able to do a little bit more. So if they wanted to go and, and, and make a trade with somebody else to take on another bad contract and get another first round pick, they'll have the luxury and the flexibility with their cap to be able to do those things. So that that's why they would make that trade Obviously, Al Horford isn't the guy that's going to take them to the promised land or nothing like that, but it gives them flexibility. You're getting another first round pick, and I'm probably going to try to give them two more picks with my two second round picks because, like I said, we have five picks going in. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine with giving them three picks. I'll give you Al Horford. You save $10 million there. Now he's also your starting center, so you don't have to waste a pick there because I think they, they should be looking to go wing with their pick personally. Isaac Okoro, Devin Vassell, wing would, would fit perfectly with them because they have uh, Garland, Sexton, Kevin Porter Jr. Go wing. Uh, Zeddy Osmond has been good, but he hasn't been good enough to where he makes you not draft at his position. <clears throat> so all of those things, and then you just give us Kevin Love. And then for us, the reason I'm a little hesitant to do this deal is because, yes, Kevin Love gives us the uh, spacing that we're looking to add with Joel and Ben. But again, we would now be paying 10 more dollars, 10 more million dollars over the next three years to have Kevin Love, number one. Um, and we already really don't have any flexibility at all. Um, Number two, it makes our front court a little clunky. Like I already spoke about having Tobias Harris as a small forward. Then you add Kevin Love and then Joel. Speed wise and pace wise, it's going to make us slow. And then if you put us up against a team like the Celtics again, it, it, like who is guarding who? You know what I mean? Obviously, Joel Embiid is going to be guarding every opposing team center and protecting our rim. 
Ben would probably guard your best offensive player, which in the case against the Celtics, that would be like Kimball Walker. You would probably put, I mean, uh, Jason Tatum, you would probably put Josh Richardson on Kimba. But then what Tobias is guarding Hayward or like Jalen Brown and then Kevin Love is guarding Gordon Hayward, which it ain't too atrocious. It ain't too bad. But, you know, it like Jalen Brown versus Tobias Harris, Jalen Brown, you know, is favorable because Tobias Harris just doesn't have the foot speed to really guard the perimeter that well. Um, but luckily for us, we have Joel Embiid protecting the rim. And I'm also concerned because at 20, at 20, 21 overall pick in this draft class, there could be something there. There could be something there. There could be something there. Um, and that is also the thing at 20, at 21, there's potential for somebody to fall. This draft has a lot of complimentary pieces, a lot of guys that are going to be good role players in the NBA, in my opinion. And if we look at prospect scouting, um, just just looking at some names, and I'm just going to fast forward through these names because obviously these guys wouldn't be available. But if you start to look in the 20s, we'll just look at, we'll, we'll go from, we'll go yeah we'll go from 16 to yeah to 20, All right? We'll start at 16 because this is where things could fluctuate. Now, if I'm looking at like Jemias Ramsey, he's a shot. He, he'd be a shot creator, attacking guy, athletic, who can who can score the ball. He would be nice um, to pick up at 21. You look at a guy like Sadiq Bay. He's pretty. He's pretty like damn near the 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 prototypical type guy that the Philadelphia 76ers are lacking right now. A guy who could guard multiple multiple positions. He can guard the threes and fours which means he'll be able to switch on a pick and roll. Um, and then he can also knock down shots to space the floor offensively at, at a forward position. So he's he's the prototypical guy that you would want to be around at 21 if you're if you're 70, if you're the 76ers. And him potentially being there makes me a little hesitant to trade for Kevin Love and give up my first round pick. But I'm not going to finesse the Cavaliers because that would make it an incentive for them to to make the trade because Kevin Love right now is the better player between him and Horford. Um, And, you know, the Cavaliers, they don't have to make that trade. They just can just keep Kevin Love and just go about their business. Emmanuel quickly is another guy who shot the ball incredible at Kentucky last season, over 40% from three and 90% from the free throw line. And he has um, defensive upside. He has defensive potential. And you see that they classify him as a 3D point. So he's a guy that you can put out there with Ben Simmons. He's not going to be ball dominant. Wouldn't, wouldn't affect Ben Simmons offensively as far as taking a ball out of his hands. And he also complements Ben Simmons because he can catch and shoot three ball. So, And then he would be able to also guard opposing point guards so we don't have to try to put Ben Simmons in positions where he's guarding uh, smaller, quicker guards on a perimeter. And we can put him on wing scores like Jason Tatum. And Emmanuel quickly can match up with somebody like a Kemba Walker. Um, other guys that could be available... Um, Tyrese Maxey, I, I think their rankings are a little wrong. As you can see, 2K, 2K ranks him around 12-ish. I don't think he would be around. Um, Paul Reed is a guy that could potentially even be around in the second round. But Jaden McDaniels is another guy like, that could be available um, at, at 21. You're looking at guys like Tyshawn Alexander, who is basically like another Josh Richardson. They're calling him a deep range shot creator. But if you look under that, his three point scoring, mid range scoring, then he also has the perimeter defense that you would like to see. Um, Aaron Neesmith, again, sharpshooter. And, but the three point score and perimeter defense is right there as his top three attributes. And those are the type of players where, man, at 21, if you can get one of those dudes, crazy. Even even my guy, Alec, Alexi, well, however you pronounce the name, because I can't. Um, he's a seven foot, like, power forward who has potential to be a stretch forward but he, his best thing is his playmaking and ball handling falls under the playmaking in 2k he can really handle the ball at, at a four at, at seven foot and he also shot what like 33 percent from three and almost 80 percent from the free throw line which people usually gauge that um is how well somebody will be able to shoot the three ball eventually over time and then he's what how old is he 18 he's 19 years old so and then we also have the two second round picks um, early on 
we have 34th and 36th. And then if you look at some of the guys that could be around for that, I mean, Grant Riller, Jalen Smith is like a, a guy that they project to be like a floor spacing uh, five who can rim protect as well. That's that's super ideal. Uh, Trey Jones is, is a defending point guard who has enough IQ to run an offense off of your bench. Um, you know, Desmond Bain is a guy that'll be able to score the ball. Uh, there's going to be a lot of guys available and around. You know, Isaiah Joe, shoot the ball flat out, three point specialist. These are guys that can complement um, the Sixers with some of those second round picks. Even you look at a guy like Jay Scrub, a, a, a shot creator. Guys going to come off the bench and, and try to get some buckets for you. These are, this is just a lot of players in this draft that I feel like from 21 and beyond, our picks at 21 and then going into the second round. Um, they can really they they can complement the team, so I'm a little hesitant with that. But um, we I can just go into the scouting. We'll go into catch up scouting, you know. Um, yeah, that that that's just the tough part. But I do think that that's like that's that's the best decision as far as trading Al Horford and the only real reasonable thing out there that we could do. As far as moving Al Horford, um, and I would, I, I would love, I would love to know, you know, how Kevin Love would fit. But again, the slowness concerns me, offensively and defensively, because this guy right here, need, he thrives in transition. But if his front court is Tobias Love and Embiid, how how often is he really getting into transition? Would be my answer. And then the the the, the possibility of keeping Horford for me would be just to move him to center. He would just be a backup center off the bench um, because of Joel Embiid's durability. Of Joel Embiid needs to sit some games out. If he needs to come out of a game prematurely, we would have Al Horford come off the bench for that. Um, and then, yeah, we would look to play Tobias at the four. And then we would try to use our draft picks at 21, 34, 36, and beyond to, to look for some wings. And then the next step with that, since I can't really make any any money um, open up for us, it would have to be to try to move these contracts. Um, everybody, like I said, is pretty much set in stone. Realistically, I'm not really going to move any. But like these two guys, I, I just don't see how they, I don't see them playing for me. I, I really don't see them contributing and playing for me, especially Zaire Smith. Like his best attribute is his athleticism and dunking. And I don't need that. I need, you have to, if you're not Ben Simmons or Joel Embiid, you have to one, either be able to defend on the perimeter or you have to be able to knock down threes. And he doesn't do either. You look at his top three uh, attributes, athleticism inside scoring, three-point shooting, they're putting up there, sure. But if we go and we actually look at his three-point shooting from a t statistical rate, um, he is, he's actually below us 70. He has the same shooting. He has the same three point overall as uh, Kyle O'Quinn. Kyle O'Quinn is a 67 overall three point shooter and he's a 69 uh, minus two. Or because he's hurt, are they saying he's a 71? E either or, 71 is just not reliable. Not, not for Zaire Smith. Not reliable. And then perimeter defense. Um, if we can slide over and find his perimeter defense, they're 66 right now. And then even if he gets healthy and he goes up to two, as they're saying, it's a 68. So, I mean, below 70 there, damn near below 70 with the three, is what? It will go up to 71, just not reliable. And we're paying him $3 million, which isn't a lot in, in normal ratings or normal teams. But for a team like us, paying all the damn money we're paying... I would love to open up $8 million between Mike Scott and Zaire Smith. So um, we're going to get into scouting and looking to move those contracts in the next episode. And then we will be looking to head into the draft and making our final decision on keeping Al Horford in that 21 first overall pick or trading them to get Kevin Love.